All right. Good evening and welcome to the Everyday Marksman, the YouTube channel is all about tactical skills for living a more adventurous life. I have a great discussion for you tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking about building up your team and their capabilities. And this is part of an ongoing theme I've got with Scenario X, which we'll catch you up on, as well as some recent discussions I've had and also listened to. So I figured this topic had a lot more people involved in it than just me. So I have a couple of guests tonight. So first off, I'm going to introduce Brent. 0331. He really should require no, no introduction. Uh, no, no introduction. So Brent, U.S. Marine Corps veteran, runs Brent 0331 or 0331 on YouTube, uh, and has a ton of great content, a lot of great conversations. Brent, happy to welcome back to the Everyday Marksman. Yeah, I appreciate the invite, and uh, glad to be on tonight. Next, we've got Les from Pegasus Test. Les is also a Marine Corps veteran, uh, specializes in logistics, runs a logistics company and has a lot of really interesting thoughts also on Brent's live streams. I feel like Brent, I'm stealing all your, your, your panel members here tonight. <laughs> no, happy to be here. All right. And also I have got Doc Larson. Welcome back. Once again, Doc is a U.S. Army veteran, uh, also runs One Shepherd uh, Leadership School, a lot of, a lot of tactics, a lot of thinking about just how to organize people and lead people and teach them to do great things. So Doc, welcome back. Yeah, thank you. Good to be here. I'm just a little upset that you have um, other guests that have more followers than me. That's other than that, I'm doing fine. <laughs> I mean, everybody's got more than me, so it's all good. <laughs> I, I, I was gonna say, Matt. Hey, don't be worried about stealing my guests. Both of these two are little little live stream horrors and love getting around. So. <laughs> what well, do you mean? This is the first one I've been on, but yours, Brent. Come on, man. <laughs> Where so, you go, I follow. You know, what they, you know what they say about building bridges, Les. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so, well, so the topic of the night. So, what we are going to be doing tonight? Um, the, the the live stream was about building a team. So, uh, Doc, you and I talked about a little over a month ago, and I mm -hmm. talked about something called Scenario X. And even on the podcast, the Everyday Marksman, I've been talking through several episodes now. It's kind of a whole series I've got running about different aspects to this. So I want to set this conversation up and then talk about what, what it inspired me to want to invite you all here, especially you three. So Scenario X is our fictional emergency situation where you live in a suburban neighborhood, you know, like Northern Virginia, and something bad happens. It's hurricane, you know, EMP, you name it. Something bad happens and basically government ceases to function correctly in your area. You know, Population centers draw off a lot of law enforcement authorities. A lot of people are just left out without power, without running water, uh, and you're kind of on your own. And the setup is that chaos is not going to happen immediately. Uh, for the most part, it's going to be a slow run up. You know, beginning people, it's like a bad storm. Hey, like we can we can battle this one out. I've got a week of supplies. We got food. You know, whatever. But then as things go on, and the power doesn't come back, and the water doesn't come back, and people's medications expire, things start getting worse and worse and worse. So in the situation, um, I think a lot of people in the Second Amendment world kind of jump right to, all right, helmets, plate carriers, and full battle rattle. Uh, but there's a there's a long leeway between lights go out and when I'm going to throw on all that gear and, and go to war. And there's a lot of other stuff that you should be thinking about. So um, to Doc's point, last time we talked, things like logistics, um, medical, taking care of people, your families, entertainment, all that kind of stuff that's just your regular disaster preparedness things before you start getting into bullets. So um, the next part of this, though, is why I invited you, you three here. Is it a while ago? I think it was a bit over a month ago. Uh, Brent, you had a discussion. You were all talking about the role of the automatic rifleman in a in a civilian group. And, and there was a lot of really, really good discussion in there around you know binary triggers and force reset triggers, though I feel like that's kind of a taboo topic at this point. Uh, but but the point was, uh, like, look, there's there's a purpose to doing these other roles, and it got me to want to ask the question of, well, then what does a, you know, a a civilian team of community members who let's say are all minimally trained to do something, what does that actually look like? You know, what what kind of training do they've got? What kind of equipment do they going to have? How important is things like ammunition commonality? Uh, what roles would they have? Is everybody going to be a rifleman, or you know, does somebody carry carry along a binary trigger or a force reset, or is there somebody carrying along with a scoped rifle and that's their role? So there's kind of all these things that fit in. 
And what roles might there exist for people who don't have a firearm? You know, observation, listening, communication. So kind of a broad swath of topics tonight. Before we get into the first set of questions here, is any, any questions from you all about the setup? No, it seems pretty straightforward what you want to accomplish here. All right, cool. So let's get into the first bit of this. Um, so Doc, when you and I talked, uh, we kind of came to this, this pit place of saying that the ideal team size would be somewhere between four and six for a lot of different reasons. Um, and I want to start with that, just kind of opening the discussion up. So if you're talking about your group of survivors, your, your community members, what is, how big is that team typically going to look like? Let's, say, let's assume just you know, for the sake of scenario, you have about 30 to 40 people. We'll say 40. You know, that's, your, that's, your, that's your local neighborhood that you've connected with and, and have made it through up to this point. So you have about 40 people available to you. How do you organize that? Yeah, so one um, just so you guys know, and and so the audience, uh, you know, in case they didn't catch that show, my contention was that a four man team, and we can say fire team, crew, whatever it is, that that's your core element of a militia of a citizens militia, right? That's your core element, but that assumes that it works as part of a larger team so that that fire team is embedded in either a squad or a section. And of course that then is embedded in, you know, something building up to 40 man, which is a platoon. Right. And so that's, um, that's my contention. But the caveat I put on that was this, <clears throat> if you're going to be doing, and I don't know why in this case you would have long range, um, but if you're long range patrolling, if you're going to be operating, um, semi-autonomously from that core element. Let's say you're going to be ranging out. It could be for foraging for that matter, foraging and hunting and stuff like this, but or gathering intel or connecting with other bipartisans, whatever that case is, if you're going to be running um, extended patrolling, um, I said a six-man uh, team actually makes far more sense than four. Four is rotated for, you know, rest and maintenance and stuff like this with other teams. Whereas if you are semi-autonomous, then you have to have three shift, uh, shifts. I said, think of it like a, like a battleship, right? And you have, or a, the Starship Enterprise or whatever. You, you are going to have three shifts per that, um, uh, per that vessel. And that, a small militia team one, uh, working uh, on a semi-autonomously would need to do that too. What I'm saying is while two people put it in the simplest terms, and we could say this about so many things, but let's just talk about security at night. You've stopped, you've bedded down into a hide. You need two guys up while the other four sleep, and you're going to rotate that. Uh, again, we can talk about this in so many different ways, but that's one that I said, okay, so if you're operating independently, six-man teams. If you're operating as a part of a larger group, four-man teams. All right. Thanks. All right. So we'll go then to, to Brent. Any, any kind of agree, disagree, or kind of on the same point with that one? I, I, I'm pretty much on the same page. And I, I mean, if I got a 40 man, like that's, that's a whole, that's pretty much a, a rifle platoon. Right. Um, and being a, being a military guy, obviously I'm going to, I'm going to take a military approach, but I 100% concur with doc. Like you have to have a minimum, three squads, right? You have to have that, that capability of maintaining, you know, security support and assault if need be, or assault could be your, your reconnaissance element that there you're pushing out, you know, while the other is prepping your defensive uh, perimeter and another one's freaking, you know, gathering firewood or hunting or whatever the case may be, if you're up in the mountains. Um, so you definitely need those three elements. Now, what do those squads look like? Well, I mean, if I got 40 guys, uh, you know, I'm going to go with, you know, 13 man uh, Marine rifle squads, uh, but that that's probably not going to be the reality. Um, so I would say probably minimum, maybe seven man squads, you know, like uh, two fire teams of three minimum with a squad leader. Um, I would say like that's that's bare bones if, if we start cutting off that 40 number. Uh, but if I like I like. If you say I got forty guys, I'm gonna go, you know, to, yeah, to freaking rifle platoon in the Marine Corps, like thirteen man rifle squads. Ev, uh, Les, what do you think? Well, I think it really depends on where somebody lives. If you live in a big apartment block, you can probably scrounge up forty people pretty easily. In suburbia, 
be lucky to get to 20. Mm. Cause you think on your street, you know, like the average house is going to have a uh, dad, a mom and kids. Well, mom and the kids aren't leaving. So that's dad. And if there's 10 houses on the street, the max you're going to get is 10 deployable assets. Mm -hmm. So where you live is going to determine the size of your unit. Yeah, definitely. I think, and we were kind of assuming a lot of geographic elements here. Uh, I, I think an interesting add to this one though, is also thinking in terms of, uh, you have know, got mom, dad, and kids. I'm going to count mom and dad as both in our, in our, in our group here, because everybody can fill a job. Maybe it's not carrying a rifle, but, um, everybody can do something. Yeah. So, can, I, can I add Matt? I, yep. that's probably a mistake I just made. Like I'm thinking 40 men. Every oh yeah. No, no, I, I think I set it up that way. No problem. Yeah. As, I say 40 people. We assume 40 fighting, 40, 40 fighting people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Okay, so I think we're all kind of roughly on the same page. Less great point about the geographic sense of this. Uh, I had one of the comments come in here talking about the pyramid structure in World War II, something they called. So I don't, I had never heard of that. Doc, you're nodding, so I think you know what that is. Yeah, I, I think what he's talking about, first off, the rule of threes is often referred to as the pyramid structure. And then in World War II, um, the army went in with a 12 man squad instead of a 13. The, the Marines have used the 13 man squad. They, they migrated to that in 1939. So even before World War II, um, where the army has just been all over the board and can't figure it out, to be honest. Um, but they had a 12 man squad. It was three maneuver elements. They did not mirror each other. I seem to recall there's like a two man scout team no, I'm not making this up. You're like, wait, what? You had your own scout? Yeah, they did. Um, so they had like a two-man scout team, the squad leader with maybe, uh, you know, someone that backing him. I forget what that job was. It might have been a medic. And then um, and then basically you had two, uh, a gun team, I think, and then a five-man fire team. It was really weird. It was this oblong kind of misshapen thing. But it was still three maneuver elements, and that's often referred to as the, uh, the uh, pyramid. I feel like we need to go down this rabbit hole now. So, um, because you mentioned two, two like other jobs that just just came out of that conversation now, because you mentioned a two man two man uh, scout element, um, uh, medical combo. So it sounds like like we're getting to what are the some other jobs? So I guess my next question I had in this whole structure is, you know, in this kind of environment, assuming you even have the equipment, is everybody a rifleman? You know, are, are we doing the Marine Corps? Or are we doing more like, well, let's pick and choose who can do what first? Kind of depends on your scenario. I mean, if your uh, abode comes under direct assault, yeah, everybody's a rifleman, you know, because you have to repel who is ever coming in. But on a daily basis, probably no, everybody's not, you know, and your, and your uh, nuclear uh, family of mom, dad, and 2.5 kids, you know, mom's feeding everybody. That's going to take most of her time. And she's keeping the kids corralled dad's out the one foraging for food and keeping things fixed and up that what the children do depend on the age of the children the two and the three year old aren't doing much the uh 12 and the 15 year old well they do a whole lot more um and there's all variables like that in it but no not everyone's a rifleman and family should be working together you know when it's time for dad to go out and find some food he should probably be getting a dad from the other house and they go out at least in a pair at a minimum you know <laughs> Yeah, are we talking kinetic operations here at this point? I mean, that's that's something you have to kind of share with us, Matt, um, because I'm going to agree. If we're doing task organization for sustainment operations, that's going to look quite a bit different. But we kind of be, and, and understandably so, I'm not saying this as a criticism, but we're kind of bouncing back and forth between, okay, we've got this, what um, USAID would call a complex uh, uh, disaster, um, so, you know, that, that might have enemy forces in it. Certainly it has a natural uh, disaster component to it. And so we could talk about that. I'm, I'm certainly willing to sit and talk about, you know, what I've learned through USAID about that. But at the same time, we keep coming back to like militia and roles. And I'm like, is this kinetic ops we're talking about? So I think that's a really, it's a fair question because uh, the way I'm, I'm thinking about this whole situation is that it escalates over time. So, uh, for, so uh, last week, I put up an episode on, on the website, so everydaymarksman.co for anybody who is, who's watching this, where I talk about uh, correlating kind of the DEF CON structure to an emergency. You know, we'll, we'll skip five at the moment because we're already, in, we're already in a disaster. So let's assume we're at four, which means heightened, heightened problems, but 
no immediate threats. Everybody's just kind of like new, new normaling. Um, I hate that phrase now, but that's kind of what we're doing. So to your point, doc, that's, that's kind of what we're saying. Sustainment operations, like we're here, we have to provide our own security. Um, nothing's kinetic yet, but then in the example, it does escalate. So, you know, we, three is, Hey, like something could be happening here. What do we do at that level? What changes? You know, my thought was, all right, if you have people doing security, now they're carrying extra ammo, right? Or they're, they're, you have extra defensive positions set up, um, you know, and, and getting people ready. Then you get two and one, obviously one being, all right, fights on everybody on your feet and let's, let's do it. Uh, but that's kind of, I, I should clarify that we're, I'm, I'm thinking we're right now and we're probably transition in this conversation going from what is that level four of, Hey, this is sustainment. We're all just kind of like living day-to-day -day life under this crappy situation and then we'll, we'll what happens when we go up from there i i mean i'll jump in and, and offer something and i don't mean to stomp on your guys toes you know brent and les just hit me with that elbow and i'll, I'll... <laughs> but um i'd say this it you know at, at defcon 4 DEFCON 5 is relative sustained peace if defcon 4 you and you say we have um let's let's say this situation is a natural disaster that leaves America open to other kind of armed conflict. And that's where it becomes a um, complex crisis, right? But it's a, so you've got a disaster and at least there's no immediate threat of, you know, quote unquote, invading forces. Then I think you're working humanitarian issues. You literally are looking for power, looking to see who's vulnerable. You're doing triage of, okay, who needs what, right? And you're trying to get you know, the, the greatest need and all this other stuff. You're, you're still being very um, egalitarian at this point. What I'm saying is you're trying to bake cookies for the neighbors who need it, or you're taking care of their dogs or their kids because they're out hunting or, you know, things like that. Very humanitarian sustainment focus. When you get to DEFCON 3, now there's um, at least the threat of something. And it can literally be um, neighborhoods next to you, not, not enemy but neighborhoods next to you that are in a bad way, starving, that you no longer have the ability, you and the other neighborhoods around no longer have the ability to help them. So they're becoming desperate and they're you know, likely to go into theft and perhaps even vandalism of property. There is the risk of you know, violence to a human. When you get to DEFCON 3, um, you're looking at um, two things. You're looking at surveillance, monitoring and surveillance. So you're looking at perimeter walls and a tiered or a defense in depth in terms of, you need platoon early warning systems out. However, you, well, I don't care if this is strings with tin cans and marbles in it, or, you know, really sophisticated uh, technologies. The fact is you need some kind of guard, right? You need some kind of guard and surveillance. And you also need a QRF, a quick reaction force. So you need those four to six guys that you can call on like that who do come running with shotguns and rifles, okay? They're not, they're not here to take out a main battle tank yet. That's not, QR, or, uh, that's not DEFCON 3. That's getting more towards DEFCON 2. But I would say if you're still just um, in your community and you now have threat to property and welfare uh, as well as to bodily harm, yeah, you're looking at surveillance, guards and QRFs. Yeah, the scenario is kind of more like as a kid, I grew up in South Florida too, specifically the Florida Keys. And when the hurricanes came in and down in the Keys before the new bridges were built, the old ones were always out. And you had that period of about 48 hours where I noticed as a kid, the adults walked around with firearms, usually just a sidearm on their hip. And that long arms were conspicuous around the house. They became more conspicuous. And like I say, about 48 hours, because usually they were pretty effective at getting the bridges back open again. And once that happened, all the adults kind of calmed down because the forms of government of control were back in place. The police were able to start policing and all that. But you did that for the looters, which I don't ever really recall any big looting, but I always heard about it on the news happening up in the Miami area and all that. Um, so your first thing you're going to deal with is looters. And looters will go after targets of opportunity. So doing anything that hardens you, and by hardening, just show that you're patrolling your own property, that can be done by one person. They're not going to mess with you. Um, 
you know, it, it gets progressively worse as supplies get worse and worse. You know, as government is unable to keep the supply lines open, because let's be honest, Walmart and Giant are going to do their best to keep their stock uh, shelf stocked. Um, it's the government's job to keep those roads and all that open so the trucks can get in. The longer they can't do that, the more desperate people will get. I think depends on the area. Some places like South Florida, like uh, the Gulf Coast, where disasters are fairly common, people tend to prep better than here in Northern Virginia. The whole time I've lived here, a long time for the power to be out is two hours. <laughs> You know, so people here do not stock up. So that period of time where things get worse are, once again, going to vary greatly by where you live. I think you and I have had some similar experiences last. I mean, I, like I was I was there in Andrew in 92 in Broward County. But uh, and then, yeah, Virginia is funny like that, like like half inch of snow is coming and everybody freaks out and buys everything off the shelves. And Yeah, it's one of the great things when natural disasters are coming. You know, the first thing you hear on the news that bread and milk are gone. It's like, what, does everybody suddenly get an urge for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in a disaster? I can never figure that one out. (laughs) All right. Uh, So, Brent, I want to make sure you give you a chance here, too. You've been nodding along drinking coffee like a true NCO. (laughs) Yeah, Staff NCO. We drink more coffee than NCOs. (laughs) We drink drink pots. (laughs) Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, it's hard, it's hard for me to wrap my head around, you know, integration of like civilians and everything. Um, I just, I think I need, would need to see what the composition is because like for me, women and children and stuff, they're going to be in the rear with the gear. Um, yeah, they're going to be trained how to shoot, but they're going to be like last minute, Hey, fill in, fill in these gaps in our, our defense but you're not going to be our QRF. You're not going to be, uh, you know, you might be running freaking ammunition and preloaded magazines out to fighting positions if they're calling or something along those lines. So it's like uh, I can't see them as being you know, bodies in my my combat support. So even if I have this, you know, 40 number, number 40, uh, you know, stuck in my head, I have to look at those and see who are my able body trigger pullers uh, to figure out, you know, who's going to do what. And then uh, is everybody a rifleman? Yes. In in concept, like I was saying, like even even the women and children, if need be, can grab that rifle and get on the the line as a last resort. But um, no, I don't I don't foresee like uh, everybody being a rifleman per se, because I do want those uh, automatic rifleman guys. I do want those, you know, life support weapons oriented on likely avenues and you know, enemy approach and, and whatnot. Um, I do want those designated marksmen with target priority lists and stuff like that. Um, you know, with, Hey, you know, somebody's coming. I want you to figure out who the head honcho is and I want you to take them out. Like that is your job. So yeah, a lot of what's going to define people's roles is what firearms they have. Um, you know, some people may just have granddaddy shotgun. Other people, might you know have enough weapons to equip an entire platoon themselves <laughs> i mean that's just the nature of it and also people's hobbies are going to affect you know it'd be nice to say yeah everybody has an ar for ammo compatibility and magazine compatibility the truth is your neighbor might be well armed he also might be a world war ii reenactor so all he has is an m1 grand and an m1 carbine um you know and the other guy might be an ipsic shooter and he has all kinds of guns which most of those race guns are absolutely useless in the field. So he might not have anything of any use to contribute <laughs> other than his skill. I think that those are both excellent, you know, the relevant points of what, what, what do you own um, and what do you know how to do? And I think this goes back to the another conversation with, you know, outside of just the shooting part of this, you know, yeah, you're going to have people who have you know, radios, people have what kind of first aid equipment or, or training do people have? Um, you know, cooking, I think that got mentioned, like people got to eat and you're probably going to be pooling resources to do that. Um, so I want to now come back though, because let, let's assume we're, we're, sw- we're switching up to that higher, higher profile. Um, but I want to go just that little transition point. So yeah, you're providing your own security. We'll say this is around that DEF CON 4 area. No, no specific thing is coming around. Um, but you're providing your own security. What is, what is the difference in equipment from that to the next level going up to three? Where like, hey, there you know of an active threat now. Like, what what changes in that trend, like that period? 
that would probably be the pres uh, presence of law enforcement in some form or other. Um, as law enforcement, as you said, gets drawn into population centers, which, which where we live here outside of Washington, D.C., that, that's a common occurrence anyways. Um, they get drawn out and you start to have security problems, neighborhood watches. So probably just having a concealed firearms more than enough at, at DEF CON uh, to uh, four and three levels, you know, if incidents of looting and violence start to happen, like, you know, people's homes are getting invaded, you're starting to have uh, crimes of violence against people and stuff, well, then you probably need to start having some kind of organized community watch type thing. And then your level of armament increases accordingly based on your threat. If you have armed home invasions, I would definitely say it's time for plate carriers and rifles. Um, you know, if you're having the thing where the random jogger at night is she's getting mugged and unspeakable things happening to her, neighborhood watch with concealed carry could probably handle that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I guess I leapt forward. When you say DEF CON 3, I'll, I'll throw out places like um, uh, Mali, um, you know, uh, Oman, uh, Syria. I, I'm thinking that there aren't you know, because Les is talking about government assets still working or still available. If I, I'm assuming that's DEF CON 4, where I'm talking DEF CON 3 is not, is two things. One, the absence of legitimate government re response. That's not happening. Something like you saw in uh, Kenosha, right? But there's another element to it um, that Kenosha re well, maybe kind of did, and that is there was a hostile element. Even in Kenosha, there was, but they weren't going after people. What the hostile element was trying to do is burn down businesses. So it was still doing violence against property. Where I'm saying there's a hostile element, I'm saying they've gone beyond, again, two things. The hostile element is organized and it's gone, meaning that they're in groups, right? It's not single acts. Um, one guy, two guy breaking in to steal your CDs. No, no, no. I'm talking about hostile, violent um, response by organized groups um, that that violence has gone well beyond property at this point. And again, there is no government there. Now, is that DEF CON 3 or is that DEF CON 2 to you? So I think one of the common threads I'm seeing is we need a common definition. So the original scenario is government stopped working correctly at the beginning like that's that's why we're in this position we're like we're like months into this thing now and it's still not working so uh yeah by the time we're we're here where we're talking is there is no there is no nobody's coming and and there is am i correct there is a violently hostile organized groups whether it's marauding groups of you know four to eight yeah. people whatever it is they yeah, you, or you 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 i understand you hear chatter you you know that other neighborhoods are now getting hit you know okay. you're taking their stuff they're hurting people and like all right now you're now you're concerned that, that you're next okay that's where i say you that that you start needing pews it's there that i say you need to form into guard shifts um roving guard shifts that have at least some form of early warning system to again everything from trip wire flares and cans with marbles rattling to dogs to uh, electronic surveillance, whatever it is. You need um, early warning systems. You need rotating guard shifts. I'll go ahead and say you should be barricading at this point. You should be finding wire and fencing and anything to barricade your neighborhood so that you know anybody who comes into that barrier, their intent is clear, right? You want the pews uh, early warning systems outside and on the barriers as much as possible. Um, your roving guards are inside monitoring out. And then inside, you need a QRF. And this is when I start organizing, whether it's a four or six man team, this is where I start saying, okay, what are our weapon systems to be an effective QRF? Do we have grenade launchers? Do we have 37 millimeter, 40 millimeter? Do we have LSWs or uh, squad auto rifles, designated marksmen? Um, and you know, I mean, we kind of laugh about shotguns, but in combat, I mean, a shot 12 gauge shotgun with the right ammunition makes, you know, pistols look like pea poppers, absolutely useless. Um, uh, up close and personal, you came through our barricade. Your intent is clear. Shotguns are fantastic. Well, yeah, let's, if you don't mind, if we go down that, um, rabbit hole of weapons real quick, 
there's four weapons that your group needs to have. You know, first is handguns because they can always be with you. They can go everywhere. You can go to the bathroom with you if you need to. You know, uh, the second thing you need is a shotgun. Why? Because on the North American continent, shotguns can kill anything so they can feed you. Um, and also for your defense, they don't outrange your handgun, but they deliver much more devastating firepower over that range. Uh, the next thing you need is a carbine. And I define a carbine as something able to put down a volume of fire and reach out accurately to about 300 meters. Uh, and then last but not least, you need a scoped rifle. And specifically that term scoped rifle, not sniper rifle. And the reason you need a scoped rifle is you need something preferably 30 caliber range so you can reliably, consistently get out to 600 meters should your area warrant it. Now, some places are not. If you're like in Arlington, Alexandria, you ain't reaching out to 100 anywhere, much less 600. So maybe that's not important there. But out in western Loudoun County, you know, yeah, you need that capability to reach that far. You should have access to all four of those weapons and have some form of proficiency in them. You know, because one of the things that allows you to do, if you go out on a foraging mission, out goes your handgun and your carbine with you. Well, these other two weapon systems are back at the house. Gives them long range and close in defense. So I think that's just to de define weapons and what they rule. If they just want to go down that rabbit hole real quick. Yeah, no. So I think there's, there's, there, you just made a point that I was going to ask about is how, you know, if any, what are, where is the role of having a 30 cal or these days having something in 6.5 Creedmoor or any of the, you know, the, the whiz bang ones? Um, where does that fit in? Is that even necessary anymore? If you can throw in a, let's, let's say you, you've got somebody who's like me and they're, they're a shooting enthusiast and just has the gamut from red dots to, to mid range scopes all in five, five, six and various things. Like, is that enough? Like, do you need to go up to that 30 cal? I'm going to, I'm going to jump in on this one. Um, so I've gone out every year. I try to make it a point to go out to Nevada and shoot with uh, Dimitri and Bruce usually comes out there with me and we, and when we shoot out there, we're typically just taking our, our five, five, six, 16 inch rifles. And I'm telling you guys, um, we're, we're hitting, we're hitting man size silhouette targets out to six, 700 meters reliably with five, five, six. So it's yep. like, how, how much further do you need to go? Now, I understand that there's like, you know, it would be ideal to have, you know, that 30 caliber round, but it, when push comes to shove, is it, is it necessary? Cause I'd almost, I'd almost be inclined to say, well, it's probably more important that we have that ammunition compatibility with everybody so that we can spread load ammunition as necessary. And then I would add one more weapon system onto what Les said. And that is, even if it's a carbine, just a weapon that is tasked with that automatic rifleman role, right? What could that be? That could be a 40 round magazine. That could be a hundred round snail drum. And he's got a bipod attached. And his task is, Hey, you are covering these main avenues of likely enemy approach. Like you are filling this automatic rifleman role. And I'm telling you, these guys on the receiving end of that, of uh, even if it's just a regular USGI standard trigger, right? Is that if that dude is putting down, consistent semi-automatic rapid fire the person on the receiving end is not going to tell it's probably not even going to tell the difference that it's a freaking semi-automatic as opposed to an automatic exactly. So, exactly agreed agreed on all points i will say this though matt when you talk heavy caliber there's one again we're up here at defcon 3 potentially defcon 2 but certainly defcon 3 and people are smart right um it's what I'm saying is if you've got marauders that are doing smash and grabs from whole entire communities, right. And using violence to, uh, as a means of coercion, you will give me this or I'll shoot six of you and take it anyway. So if that's what you've got, you've probably, they've got to find some form of mobility. And I would have to assume that's going to be vehicles of some kind or another, right? They need the mobility one, not only because, they're using this violence to get stuff, but now they have to haul it away. And you've got to do that quickly or your victim catches up with you and just, you know, beats you and takes it back, right? So mobility. When you talk about a heavier caliber, I, I'm i with these guys. Look, 5.56 five, or 7.62 by 39 rule. I'm a big fan of 5.56. Five, 7.62 five, by 39 is a very viable caliber. But you want everybody in your neighborhood to have that as much as possible or maybe even both. 
But when you have people coming up in cars and vehicles and stuff like that, the one thing, it's not what people think. They're like, oh, I'm going to get my 6.5 Creed more and I'm going to take a 1200 meter shot. You don't need to. There's very, very few places where you're going to do that. And it's just a god awful, terrible home defense, right? It's a horrible home defense weapon. I'm, I'm using little handguns that with expanding tips and my little carbine with expanding tips. I don't want to go through many drywalls. But now, if I'm engaging marauders with vehicles, I want to punch through that vehicle. And now that starts to have a role, whatever that is. Well, that's a three, three, you know, three, three, eight Lapua, fifty BMG. <laughs> I mean, whatever it is, the more penetration in that case. Um, but here again, what's really fascinating is not only are we identifying weapon systems and roles of the militia group, but you're also now beginning to talk about specified targets. And I think this is what we're trying to impress upon people is that the squad automatic rifle, regardless of whether it's full auto or semi-auto or any variant in there in between, it has a role, a function. It has primary targets and secondary and tertiary targets. And same with a, a heavy weapon, uh, same with a heavy rifle. So the thing that stands out to me, and, and Brent, I think you were the first one to mention this, like the target priority list. Um, you know, that to me now says something like this is the skill. We're gone, we're gone past it's about hardware. Now it's about what do you know how to do? Uh, and where is that where is that specialty that training gonna come from? Um so I agree. I, I I totally agree with this one that a lot of times we get focused on hardware solutions to software problems of like this is more about how you think about it than what you use to do it. Um, all right, hold on. Let me catch up on the questions real quick. So there's a couple that came in earlier. Uh, come back in here. Uh, so I thought this one was interesting. This has been touched on in many places. Uh, you know, if assuming you're having able-bodied 15-year-olds, but they're out of out of what we can do, where are you going to find them? I think you use what you got. Um, and... <laughs> I mean, I think in a situation like this, people probably start putting a bit more of a fire under them. It might be a little bit late in the game, but they'll figure it out. Can I can I touch on that question yeah. there? So, yeah, not, not fit for for military service. But uh, if if there's one thing one shepherd has taught me going up there for the last several years, you get a whole gamut of people, right? <laughs> All different uh, sizes, shapes, and m face it. Let's face it; like most of them are not like your ideal serviceman. But yet these guys after a week of, you know, training at one shepherd are conducting full blown 48 hour field training exercises. And, uh, you know, granted these guys have the right mindset, right? Most of them, they're all paying students. Like they're going up there specifically for training. So, uh, even though that they might not be the, you know, cookie cutter stereotypical, what, what would we think and what we'd want for military service? I think most of these guys are, are pretty much your average Joe Blow American citizen build wise. And they're still able to perform some of these military tasks. Most of the military tasks that were demanding of them at these one shepherd semesters. So um, even though this percentage is saying like 75%, you know, aren't fit, that doesn't mean that these people can't do the job. Yeah. And if I could pile onto that too, um, you know, 75% may not be fit. Boot camp has a really amazing way of getting people fit. <laughs> it's ama amazing how they've uh, done that over 100 years. Um, the other thing is people step up. One Shepherd's a great example. Uh, we all know one guy, we won't mention him here, but he actually brings a tactical cane with him, <laughs> you know, but he won't quit and he's not a detriment to the unit. I don't think any of us would say that, you know, he performs a very vital thing and he's always in the fight, you know, usually the last guy to go down, you know, so physical fitness absolutely has a point, a uh, part in military operations, but it's not the be all end all of all things. <laughs> yeah. A lot of, let's remember that a lot of physical fitness and okay, let me say it and then I'll back off it. A lot of physical fitness isn't really about getting the mission done guys. It's about surviving the wound. It, it is. It's about surviving or surviving the harsh weather or whatever it is, right? The potential danger, and it's the ability to survive that and bounce back and come back into the fight. Um, there's That's at least a component of it. It is, of course, also getting the mission done. But as um, 
Brent and Les have alluded to, what we find at One Shepherd is, okay, tailor the mission. All right, so you're not going to hump 18 miles. I'm going to have to put you in pickup trucks and drive you in for the first, you know, 15. You're going to walk the last three. All right. Okay, so we tailor the mission to our capabilities. Um, but, but also remember that a lot of the physical ailments are things like flat feet. Um, you know, I, I, I'm colorblind. Um, you know, just, just, or I, I'm a diabetic. I'm a diabetic, but it's under control. I mean, these are things that take people out, and then you see them in a extended 12-hour battle, and you're like, shit, that didn't slow that guy down. So what are you talking about? What The military standard is necessarily very, very high, and I agree. I've heard the same thing. I would. It's easy to believe 75% are unfit, but you're talking three measures. It's what is it? It's physically, moral, and mental, right? So if your IQ isn't high enough, you're not fit. Um, or if it's too high, you're not fit. That's not a joke, by the way. No, it's um, not. I have seen that in action. That is yep. not a joke. <laughs> so if it's too low or if it's too high, you're not fit. Um, moral. Oh, yeah, you've had a DUI. In fact, you've had two DUIs. Uh, no, we're not going to recruit you. You see what I'm saying? But in the fight, uh, that drunk bastard might be, you know, really good on that uh, machine gun for a while you know, until he passes out. <laughs> So I, I think this is a worthwhile like deviation a little bit because it kind of ties to this whole situation. But something that uh, Brent mentioned, actually, y'all have kind of alluded to this one. Um, I'll set this up with there's a there's a phrase I can't remember who who actually originally said it to me, but it was along the lines of that uh, ammunition equals time in contact, and physical fitness equals how long you're going to last in an emergency. But then a lot of it kind of tied back to this men mental game of uh, not giving up, sticking sticking into it and just like, all right, I'm going to do the thing. Like, sure, I'm carrying around extra weight. I'm, I'm in bad shape, but you know what? This is going to get done. And you, and you stick to that grit, I guess, is the way to, to think about it. Um, and I know the military has a way of teaching you to develop grit because if you don't, you're probably not going to make it in a lot of ways. But um, where do you suggest, like if the average person, they want to they develop that grip. They've never really been that kind of challenged in their life. How do they do that? One shepherd. Yeah. I would say it's a shameless plug, but it's absolutely right from everything that like, Doc no, and I talked about. Like, it's just... And I have to say, I've watched people being in the program and now being one of the instructors there. You watch people... Um, there's a point, usually in the FTX at about Friday night, we've identified it, that people have to really reach down and find something inside them. Wish I had the whole speech in front of me that Joe McGoffin always gives. But you see people, they start the FTX and they're like, yeah, everybody's super thing. 24 hours later, they're smoked, their feet are messed up, they're hungry. You know, they're trying to make that decision. Am I going to poop in the woods or try to hold it? You know, they may have just had a very uh, bad battle that didn't go their way and they're cold and they're wet and they're miserable. And the only thing they're thinking about is quitting and going back to that nice warm sleeping bag in, in the tent. And to a, a person, because it's men and women, I've watched they reach down in it. And when you walk out and you go, yes, I know it's raining. Yes, I know you're cold. Your turn on guard duty. Get out there. I've never had anybody refuse. They all do it. And when we're done and we've had our AAR, and we've turned our gear in and we're enjoying our hot steak and our cold beer, everybody's proud of themselves. They all have a sense of accomplishment. So, yeah, if somebody needs that. One Shepherd's the place to go. I, if I, I've, uh, I've got a story on that just to piggyback off that. Um, so this last semester is 40th anniversary semester. Uh, the enemy launched an attack on us. And they ended up, we repelled the attack, but they got a couple of guys behind our lines, right? And we had already been tasked with hire, from hire, to conduct an, an assault, a final, our final assault on the enemy at a certain time, right? And it was imperative that we killed these guys behind us, because if we didn't, that little small enemy element behind us could have alerted the enemy that we were stepping off and leaving our positions and what else are we going to be doing, obviously? And we would, you know, the, the, the attack would have failed, right? So I literally had to task guys for hours going out there and hunting down these dudes behind our lines to get them, right? 
And I remember uh, two two to three hours into like hunting these guys, their team leader comes to me. He's like, he's like, Brent, my guys are smoked. Uh, you know, they they don't they've been at it all you know all day and all night. And I'm like, I hear you, man. But here's the deal, man. You, you have to you have to keep pushing. And I was like, we have to get these guys, otherwise it's going to foil our whole tack. And they did it. They kept going. And these are civilians, right? And then another scenario or talking about what doc was talking about, you know, uh, using their capabilities. So we have a portly guy. I'm not going to me mention his name, but, uh, there was another time, another one shepherd semester. Um, <laughs> you know, I put him in the headquarters. Well, he was put in the headquarters element and, uh, he became a radio operator. And while other guys were digging fighting positions and kicking out a reconnaissance, he was stringing field phone lines. He was stringing wire and he did a fantastic job as the radio operator. And, uh, you know, we, we used his strengths to our advantage. I, we, he wasn't getting sent out on these long range reconnaissance patrols because we know he's not going to make it. Right. But guess what? That dude wired up all the fighting positions with comm wire and field phones, kept the radio running, kept comms with hire. Uh, we used we used his strengths to our advantage. So, yeah, that's yeah, what you yeah. have to do in these situations. Yeah. And to piggyback off Brent on that scenario and stuff. That contributed because the later that night when we were hit, that excellent communication that he had set up was instrumental in repelling the attack. <laughs> so, yeah, you're going to have everybody has a strength. You know, um, one of the glories of the National Guard, just to segue for a moment, is you take any company of National Guardsmen. Everybody knows how to do anything through their prior service or through their civilian job. No matter what you task that unit with, somebody there knows how to do it. Um, and you just, people, you just play to people's strengths. Like Brent was saying. <laughs> Doc, you've been surprisingly quiet. So I know you're going to say something. No, I mean, I'm, I agree with what they're saying. I mean, th this is how you, how do you develop, you know, strength like that inner strength, that grit, um, you put yourself in situations. And I think, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I got distracted there. Um, but I think you can say things like, okay, I'm going to go do a marathon. Yeah, that will absolutely develop grit. That absolutely it will. But you have to have the athletic stamina to run 26.3 miles, right? So I'm going, all right, are you really going to run a marathon? Are you going to do an Ironman? Um, are you going to do a Tough Mudder? Um, that's that is definitely, I'm not diminishing it at all. That's definitely ways to uh, form grit and put yourself in some extended discomfort and push, find it deep down when you know you could quit and go back to comfortable, you know, warmth and dryness and cookies and milk and all that. And you push yourself beyond it. Um, but that's only good for athletic people. And there are ways for non-athletic people to do this as well. And so one shepherd is the obvious. I'm going to say, we'll go to one shepherd. But it, if you don't, if for whatever reason you're saying, well, I'm in this country and, you know, COVID won't let me fly into America. Okay, fine. Grab your rucksack, go up into the mountains, you know, find some national park in your, in your country and start going on extended humps and set yourself. Um, some pretty challenging obstacles. I'm not saying be foolish about this and get yourself injured because I'm not advocating doing it alone. I'm saying find four or six of your best friends, get your land navigation skills out, mark some on trail, off trail uh, targets, and go do a four, you know, a three day weekend out in the mountains or in the wilderness. And that's another way of forming grit, and it's another way of forming bonds with people from your neighborhood that you could potentially form into your militia. I think that's a really important thing to me is just thinking in terms of like, not everybody is going to be able to do, all right, I'm going to throw on a ruck and go, you know, 12 miles with, you know, 50 pounds on my back. Um, but maybe somebody could, could really teach you how to do build a fire or teach you how to like, Hey, like we're going to share these skills once along amongst each other and you learn how to do this stuff. Well, think about it. You know, your home is a very important thing and abandoning it is not a decision to be taken lightly. That's why these bug out things always crack me up because you can maybe take 1% of everything you own, you know, and you're abandoning everything in your life if you leave your house. Um, so are you really going to be ruck marching far? 
I mean, you might take your Alice pack up to the supermarket and try to get what's left there. But if we're in this bad a situation, supermarkets probably long since been looted and hasn't been restocked. Um, where are you humping long distances to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point. And, I, and I'll just, I'll throw on, on, on the developing grit. Such the developing grit idea is that something that I, I have, you know, it's the same, same attitude It's challenge yourself. I think far too many people in life or in the U S take the easy path as much as they can and they don't ever challenge themselves. And then therefore they feel mentally weak when a virus happens to break out in the world and everybody decides I need to raid toilet paper because I don't know what else to do with my life. That's the one thing I could control is to go buy all the toilet paper I can find. And, and you, you see situations like that where it's just, had you taken a little bit of time to like challenge yourself, be like, I'm going to be okay. We're good. I'll figure it out. Uh, the toilet paper one was just funny to me because I, I did a, I did a month long canoe trip in Northern Saskatchewan years ago. And I remember I, I, we had guides because I'm not about to do that by myself, but, but we had guides and they said, all right, we got one roll of toilet paper. And we were like, oh, cool. Can I use it? They're like, nope, this is for building fires. So they're like, what are we going to do? There's two kinds of ground moss out here. The green one has aloe in it. Pick out the pine needles. The white one is, is really nice as long as it's wet. If it's, if it's dry, it's like sandpaper. Don't you? And we're just like, really? Really? It works. But I mean, it's just like the, those little challenging grit situations where it's just like, what can I do that I'm uncomfortable with? And then that just takes you to the next level, just repeatedly. And that's a really, really gross story. So, but it, it, it's part of the history, right? Um, all right. So I want to come back now to the, to the kind of the topic at hand. I really like the direction we were going here. Um, but one of the questions that came out, actually, one of the comments in here, uh, Actually, this is on my reading list. This is on my to read list. I'm on a goal to read a book a month right now. I would love to do more, but time is hard. So on a book a month, this is on my queue. Has anyone else read this one? So, all right. Well then, um, Greg, I'll, I'll have to come back to that one, maybe write a review on it. Uh, and then this one also came up in our conversation about uh, 30 cows. Would you dual roll a DMR as an anti-material? I think... Sure, I don't know enough about this to say one way or the other. Yeah. Well, the first thing that's going to come down is what is your DMR? I mean, that's a nebulous definition anyways, because uh, a DMR could just simply be, for example, a 20 inch AR with a nice scope on it. That could be a DMR. So could a uh, M1A with a decent scope on it, you know, but your cheap uh savage 30 cal with three by nine scope that you got at the big box store for 300 bucks could be a dmr um and yeah you could use it against material you know probably vehicles yeah sure why not uh yeah that's an interesting one um how do you employ precision rifles you yeah know, in, in a situation like this right and so one of the things i'll say about your your dmr and it's your the only reservation I have about a uh, bolt gun, um, it's the rate of fire. It, I I love bolt guns. Don't get me wrong, joy to shoot, incredibly accurate. Can it be a anti material? Yes. Um, you know, but let's be honest. How quickly can you, um, you know, target? multiple different threats and engage them, how quickly can you do that? And then I think that's why a lot of times DMRs are going to be semi-auto uh, because you can, and they are generally low recoil, but you, you know, that ability to go from one target to another re 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 uh, relatively quick where I, I'm in agreement, by the way, I'm not disagreeing saying, no, you wouldn't use a DMR for anti-material, but I, I do want to say, Hey, realistically, um, how quick can you fire that? So if you're talking a 308 or something bigger and you're saying that's going to be my DMR and anti-material, I would still kind of try and encourage you, if you have it available to you, to go to semi-auto. Um, that That's that's it. I mean, otherwise, yeah. Um, bolts will work. Bolt guns will work. Absolutely. In a general note, just on general logistics, when it comes to your firearms, you want your handgun to be a Glock in nine millimeter. You want your rifle to be some form of AR uh, and your shotgun needs to be 12 gauge. 
you know, in a perfect world. Uh, and, see, and, I, I'm not a. I, this goes about to running joke with me. I'm just not a fan of Glocks. I'm, I'm like, I'm like the history over here with three C, three CCs on the wall behind me. So uh, you know what? And it I doesn't matter if you like Glocks or not. Parts are everywhere. You'll keep them running no matter what. Magazines will be everywhere. You know, not that CZ is a bad gun in every measurable way. You could say a CZ is better. You're not going to find the CZ mags everywhere. You're going to find Glock mags everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I'd say you know glocks and probably a, a close second to that would be any 1911 so you know but nine millimeter glocks for the material support nine millimeter because the ammo is so prolific uh, but at least here in the united states 1911s and 45 acp are are a second option just like uh, that's to me that's i agree nine millimeter and probably a glock but at least nine millimeter handgun yep that's a no-brainer. That's what you want your militia group to have because it's interchangeable. Um, and then AR-15 in 5.56. Five, now, can you do 762 by 39 with SKSs, RPKs, and AKMs? You bet. And that's a very, very, that's probably the second most common, right? So why wouldn't you choose that? Um, that's what I'm saying about the 1911s. This is a, a age old fight. I'm, I'm not a fanboy. I mean, I'm just not. I, I like them both. I don't have a problem with either one, um, but uh, this is an age-old fight. For me, this is an interesting fight because <laughs> I'm like a handgun uh, in a militia martial setting. We're going to argue about a handgun. Shouldn't we argue about more important things like, I don't know, what color boots we're wearing? Um, because <laughs> handguns' impact on the battle space probably has less impact than the color of boots we're wearing. It's just a non-issue for me. I don't care if you carry a twenty-two handgun. So the funny thing about that one to me is how many people get wrapped up around the axle around it, and and it's just like, and like I don't understand why we didn't buy this latest and greatest pistol, and it's that's the exact reason right there. Like it, it 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 its impact is really just not there. I served in two combat theaters in two different parts of the world. No one ever shot at me with a handgun. I can promise you, I've never been shot at with a handgun. My, my fo favorite story about uh, handguns in the military was when I was a gunner, they sent me to qualify with it. They just sent me over. I never shot a pistol in the Marine Corps at all. I just, I raided a pistol because I was a gunner in a machine gun team. I literally get over there with an M9 and having never even messed with it, I literally just got issued it that morning and they sent me over to the pistol qualification. And uh, thankfully, I qualified expert, but just because I shot with a pistol prior to going to the Marine Corps, but like that, I had no formal training whatsoever. <laughs> that sounds very typically Marine Corps. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're about to get into kind of wrapping this up, and then letting any other que questions that pop up. But so I want to close out this this kind of open question of going back to the whole uh, squ squad idea or fire team. Fire team. Um, you know, if you were if you were telling somebody, hey, if you're trying to be the guy who can equip your team. You know, you 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 have the capacity to kind of build that collection. What would that mix look like? Like, how many ARs? How many DMRs? How many are going to be equipped with bi binary triggers or anything like that? Like, if, if, if figuring a team of six or multiple teams of six. Are you, is the premise that like say, oh, well, I have this large collection of firearms, or oh, I have all this money that I can gonna go spend <laughs> to equip this team? Is this like the the dream equipment thing, or is this? No, I, I think this would be like if you're trying to just kind of like for people who can think about what would what would that look like, or what would be a, a aspirational of like, all right, what would it look like if if I was trying to say, hey, I think we should have this kind, of, you know, and we're a little bit a little bit beyond work with what you've got. Um, I would sit there and say. You know, if you're if you live in a highly urbanized area that allows firearms, I know those are rare. You know, you really don't need much above a carbine, shotgun, carbine, handguns. Probably the one place the handguns probably going to do you good, just because it can be concealed and go wherever you need to go as you filter around. Um, the further out of the urban area you get, the more important um, range becomes. So, I would encourage my team those who are the better shooters to invest in good rifles and equipment, you know, preferably as Brent pointed out in the desert, five, five, six can get out pretty far. So be encouraging like one of them to like, Hey, get your AR configure to do this role, you know, like, a, uh, like a SPR or something like that, have him invest in good optics 
you know, the other guy who's maybe the crappier shot is like, you know what, PSA M4 is going to get you through and save your money there and work on magazines and ammo for the group, you know. You said we got a squad of six now? Yeah. Or, or like multiple, like if you would, if you're, if not, if, if not every squad's identical, then, you know, then what would that difference okay. look like, I guess? Well, I, I w I'm just going to go with like seven. Okay. So two fire teams of three and then a squad leader um, is, is minimum for me. Um, I would have one of these in each fire team. Now this is a semi-automatic um, <laughs> beta mag is just, just to push the point of a high capacity style magazine by no means am I recommending beta mag quite the contrary. It's not a very reliable magazine, but just some sort of larger capacity magazine, whether that's, you know, Magpul forties or the uh, D sixties or D eighties, whatever they are. Um, but something along these lines, some guy, something that is designated a designated automatic rifleman role in each fire team. And then, in one of those fire teams, so and essentially one per squad, I would have a designated marksman, somebody with a, a higher variable optic, whether that's like a one to six or a one to eight, so that he can be tasked with those target priorities. Uh, and then obviously your squad leader is command and control, and then everybody else is a rifleman. And that's assuming we don't have access to grenade launchers or any of the other good stuff. I, I was thinking exactly the same thing, Brent. That's the breakdown and the rationale why I would do it. If if I had a uh, pretty decent 12-gauge, a good pump or reliable uh, semi-auto, I might arm my squad leader with that because it has two, it can go back into two different modalities. Number one, I can shoot, you know, buckshot, different variants, double lot buck, single lot butt, whatever. All the way down to, you know, a number four turkey shoot can still just, it just puts out a hell of a pattern. Um, I don't want the squad leader shooting at 800 meter targets. I want him directing his combat power. And so arming him with maybe a sidearm, but um, a shotgun makes a lot of sense because it says, hey, do this. But also for those things that come in close and he wants to do penetration, throw in a slug. You drop in a, you know, a few slugs down that tube and you are penetrating uh, really, really well against, you know, vehicles around barriers and stuff like that. So I wouldn't mind doing exactly what Brent said, but if I have it available, I'll go ahead and uh, arm the squad leader with a 12 gauge. And, and probably that 12 gauge can shoot a flare too. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. For, yeah, for different pyrotechnic signaling, all that stuff. Good point. See, y'all got me thinking about shotguns. Now. I've always kind of neglected, like, yeah, I'm never really going to, use that but hey, look, if you're in a situation it. where it's so bad that you know there's no law enforcement or government of any type around you're not going to have logistics either so you're going to need a shotgun to feed everybody <laughs> all right so that's going to kind of run out that conversation there's a couple of questions that came in here that i'll, I'll pop up but I, i'm going to start with the first question here because brent you mentioned this in this this tyson article i published this morning on the website so um, you mentioned having somebody with a one to six. So uh, the, what I published this morning was talking about uh, this this triad between weight, balance of a weapon, and then also its capability and durability. And I brought up the point that when the, the M16A1 came out in 1963, 1967, uh, that it weighed 6.4 pounds. And it was lightweight, and that was the intent. Like, look, we're using we're using lightweight aluminum alloys. We're using pulp plastic. Um, we're shooting a lightweight bullet. It is six point four pounds. Uh, you know, throw in a twenty round magazine and a sling, and you're like on the cusp of seven pounds. And whereas you look at something like the M sixteen A four today, which unloaded is close to ten pounds, and then you start throwing optics and and everything else on there, we're getting into twelve pounds, thirteen pounds. Uh, whereas, you know, the M14 we replaced was 9.2 up to 11. So like we're, 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 redu we're removing that weight benefit that we gained. So one of the questions that I was posing is, you know, when you start looking at something like the squad common optic, like, which was a Trigicon one to six, and it's 2.1 pounds by it, like 2.1 pounds. And you're going to throw it on your rifle. Like at what point do you have diminishing returns over? Like this is no longer a nice lightweight weapon system. That's easy to carry and shoot. 
and we're just everybody's carrying beasts around like what like i know you gain that that magnification on that but i don't know what do you think where is that where is that diminishing returns for you oh i mean that's that's difficult to answer because everybody's going to have their own their own um idea on this right me personally man it, my go-to if i'm getting dropped in the middle of north korea or iran <laughs> i gotta fight my way out my go-to has a as an acog with an rmr on top right because i understand that an acog is not a good close quarters battle weapon uh but that's what they are rmr for but i also understand that you know my only experience in combat i don't want to sit here and be going back and forth between magnifications when i was fighting in the joff cemetery <laughs> that wasn't on my mind it, and i in all the exposures i had to the enemy were very very brief i saw them for split seconds i had seconds to take shots i i didn't have time to do to do this number right but that acog with rmr not that i had one back in that cemetery i wish i did um you know i could have aimed in and had that fixed four power magnification jimmy on the spot okay so me personally that is the combo i like um a lot of people like variables and i have several ar-15s that have variables they are great okay but my experience with variables is it's like it's either one or it's all magnification like <laughs> i don't use any of that i've never used any of the stuff in between um so it's like okay you know what what's the magnification that's best for you okay because i me personally, like I never sat there and be like, yeah, I, I think I'm going to use six X right now. Uh, no, this is definitely eight X. I, I, I haven't found that, um, that very viable. <laughs> and I'll point, I'll point out that the reason you just gave about, um, you don't have time to switch back and forth was exactly the conversation that Jeff Gerwich on one stream was saying, this is why he advocates. If you yeah, LPVOs are great. Keep a mini red dot offset on it because he just left his on six X the entire time he was overseas. Yeah. Uh, and he was, he was, um, army SF, but yeah, yes. the entire time he was overseas, he left it on six X and then kept his dot. All right, I'm getting close. Just immediately turned it. Yeah. So I watched that stream of yours with the, the him debating the, the reticle guy. And like, I was on board with everything he was saying, his experiences were mine in combat. So, I mean, there is a, you know, take it for what it's worth guys. You know, you have one guy that's a special forces uh, operator for however many years. And then, you know, my experiences in combat were, I'm not saying we're the same as his, but my experiences in the gear that would have worked best and, what was best in combat were were these type of, of things so can i, can I jump in? yeah so i'll start with the platform um so the platform is m16 a1 versus um a you know two three four or the m4 right so the i think mike klein said this best and i'm a big fan of his work uh on you know ar uppers and he said uh, one time to me, which definitely reflected my experience with it. He said, the M16A1 was a gunfighter's rifle. The M16A2 was a marksman's rifle. And I, and I love that he said that. I remember getting A2s with the 101s, and we went out to a 500-meter KD range, and we were giggling like schoolgirls. We couldn't believe, you know, all the little tricks in the trade that we had – you know, tried to squeeze everything we could out of those A1s at the 500 KD ranges. And we did, and we used them successfully, but God dang, it was hard. We went to A2s and it was just, it was almost like closing your eyes. You know I mean? It was just so easy. But the thing about the A2, not just the weight, but the added length of the pole of the buttstock, everything. It was a marksman's rifle. Loved it for that. I fought better with the A1. I fought better. It was lighter. It was shorter, shorter buttstock, you know, and I, I could get in tight with it. So old Klein, what he did was, and I don't know, you guys may have seen this. Have you seen his A1 that he cut the handle off and he made it a flat top? Now, this is a 6.4 pound, you know, that I think he just turned to whatever, 6.3 pounds or something. And then he puts an optic on it. And so I'm like, whoa. You know, you swipe, sweep that rifle up and you almost throw it over your shoulder. It's so light. It's like, oh, okay. Um, and I, I mean, just I'm, I'm mentioning this because, you know, if you are now setting up your like militia team and saying, okay, you know, 
the end of the world is coming. The Nazi alien zombies are attacking. Um, if you have the, the opportunity to call it now, I'm not saying you can get A1s for retro, oh, to be all cool and retro. I'm saying A1s are still an incredibly viable fighting tool. They are ammo compatible with everybody else. Um, you know, like I said, just seriously give that some thought so that you can keep a nice light rifle. If that's what's important to you as a rifleman. Um, and then you want to put an optic on it. There's nothing saying you can't go to an A1 flat top. Um, and then I would say like when you're talking LVPOs and stuff, I can't really imagine a rifleman wanting that. That's more like a DMR thing to me, but I don't know. Someone may. Everybody has their preference. I, on going lightweight, I have to admit, I've recently got one of the uh, What Would Stoner Do rifles and even completely ridiculously tricked out with my uh, pack and uh, my optic and putting a 14 on it and everything. It's still ridiculously light. I think it just, with all that crap bolted to it, I think it just barely creeps over six pounds. So that's really nice. It also comes with a uh, hell of a price penalty too. So your wallet gets to say in that uh, thing. Also, I got to say, um, I had a great debate one time with Carl from InRange, and he was totally a fan of uh, the A1. And I was like, you know, my A2 always worked. I took my A2 downrange. I took it to the field. I never feel burdened by it. And Chris and Brent, you can vouch for this, that every one shepherd, I'm the guy who walks into the arms room and grabs the A2. <laughs> you know, so I, I don't think the weight penalty is really that different. <laughs> well, I carried an A2 and OIF1 and an A4 and OIF2, and uh, they served me very well. I'm glad to hear all the, all the love for the rifle length. That's my, 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 I'm a fanboy of the, of the long barrel. So I, I, so just to throw on here, I do have one of my, probably one of my favorite rifles actually is, was A1 inspired. I call it the A1.5. Um, but it is because I, I took modern thinking, I took like a modern receiver, flat top, no forward assist. Uh, and then plastic, but Magpul plastic hardware on the handguard and the, the buttstock. And then Faxon's gunner profile barrel, 18 inch. So it's really thin, taper down. Um, and then had to find somebody to like pin pin the front side post on it. I love that thing. I, I originally built this iron sights only, and I know it now it has a aim point M5 on it, but that's a wonderful rifle to shoot. And you know, I, I'll, I'll point out that if you're shooting um, Hornady critical defense or something like this, um, you know, the length of your barrel almost, I won't say is a zero factor. It, it does factor in in different ways, right? So, but it, it's just, you're splitting hairs. You're splitting hairs. Now, hold on. We're in DEF CON 2, DEF CON 3. You know, ammo's becoming scarce. I mean, there's no deliveries because the hospital isn't working. The police aren't around. Now you're going to 55 grain or 62 grain, that sort of thing. Here is where your 20 inch barrel starts paying dividends over all of those short barrels. Um, it is in your terminal ballistics, and I won't go into a whole diatribe, but here's the long and short of it. You're at a 20 inch barrel, your 55 grain is losing yawn fragmentation at 210 meters, your um, 62 grain is losing at 190 meters. So between the two of them, they're averaging right around 200 meters, and it is still turning sideways and exploding, yawn fragmentation. You go down to an 11 inch, and it loses the ability to do that somewhere around 30 meters. 30 meters compared to 200 meters. So that's where you start going, hey, you know, these tiny, sexy little carbines, you know, especially when you, like you said, Matt, when you're getting a 20 inch M16A1 and it's in at 6.4 pounds and you get the 20 inch barrel, Jiminy Christmas. Again, I, I love my A2. I got no problems with A2s. Love them. But I will say, if if weight is what you're concerned concerned about, A1s are a hell of a fighter. All right. I love a good gear talk. There are a couple of questions that come in here. I don't want to ignore them. Um, so TK said he's been looking for you guys all night. So welcome, TK. Glad you found us too. Uh, so one of the things that popped up here was invest in good ammo too. So not just your weapons, but this goes to your, your logistics supply chain. So I think, yeah, ammo is, is huge. Don't buy the cheapest junk you can get. Um, 
this is where I'll probably go plug an affiliate link for, for an ammo thing I've been working with, but I won't. Um, but yeah, buying good ammo is going to make a difference. And you should be thinking about that all the time and not just when it's in a rush. So uh, I like the phrase goes, buy ammo slowly. So don't think you have to go buy a thousand rounds today when everybody's panicking, but buy an extra box or two every time you go shoot and just set it aside over time. All right, tracers, where do they fit in, if at all? Uh, that goes that goes back to uh, you know your squad leader, uh, marking targets, uh, designating targets. You know you're all know. Hey, team one, hey, you know, engage this building that I'm putting my tracers into. Um, you know things along that those lines. Oh, we have a comments here. Was that that goes both ways? Tag on that comment about the thirty cal tracers. One of the problems you have with tracers is they do start fires, you know, and so you know they're they're horrible training ammo. I remember uh, back in the mid two thousands, you could get a thousand M eight five six tracers, you could get a thousand bullets, and I think it was like fifty bucks, <laughs> you know, for reloading just bulk bullets and stuff. But killing the uh, tracer element is not worth the effort. And there's no range you can go use them at because as soon as one lights off, the RO is on you. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a false economy. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say that's something we constantly deal with in the Marine Corps going on live fire ranges is freaking fire start. <laughs> it's almost mm -hmm. it's almost a guarantee. It's like how much oh, training can you get in before we have to do a ceasefire and everybody goes down there with their freaking uh, covers and <laughs> whatever it is, your little fire brooms to – to put That's out another thing too. Look at uh, any picture you've ever seen of a tracer live fire range. You see all the muzzles all zeroing in the target, but you always see rounds bouncing up too. It's not flat. It's the rounds are going everywhere. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I, I, tracer tends to be cheap here on the civilian market because nobody can get rid of it because there's no place to safely shoot it. I, I like tracers because they start fires. <laughs> I mean, uh, we burned down a, a mountain in Korea. <laughs> it was like, good God, the mountain is burning down. Um, but I, I like them because they do that. Now, um, you know, uh, you think about that again, hitting a hard target, hitting a vehicle. Um, if I need to get people out of a given area, it's kind of nice to reach out with my private little flamethrower and set that brush on fire and get those guys out of there. So I'm thinking like a machine gunner again, but... And the tracers have their time and place. Are they really worth it? The, like you said, the hardest thing is getting a place to use them where you can train with them. Yeah, and to piggyback on that, like one of the things about your team is you have to go out and train. You can buy all the gear you want. If you don't go and train with it, um, it's not going to do you any good. <laughs> yeah, the training thing is is huge is why. And one of the things I advocate a lot is people go do competition and do competition with your gear and not, necessarily take out the race gun yeah you're probably not going to beat the the guy running all the gear the race gun stuff but the point is to get practice with your equipment i'm uh, glad you said that because like there's one thing i shoot competition when i can and <clears throat> there's sometimes i'll walk up to a stage and i'll be like i'm gonna get the tactical value out of the stage rather than the point value and it usually means you par out on it and stuff and i've generally found if you tell an ro that hey look you know I'm going to do this this way because I want the training value. They'll go, oh, okay, go for it. And they'll even sometimes let you run right past the part-time because they see what you're trying to do. Yeah, that's huge. I, and I've, I've told people, a lot of people, that's why I really, I'm a big fan of these things like, um, I think Woodland Brutality is coming, which I think y'all are involved with. So, mm -hmm. so like stuff like Woodland Brutality, Desert Brutality, um, you know, uh, tactical two guns or like the biathlons I see people doing, like they're, they're, they're around where it's go, go throw your gear on armor division, trooper division, use your gear and then go do it. And you start seeing what works, what doesn't work. There was a great, um, there's a and great you, quote. I, I had a guest one time. He we were talking about the tactical games, which is a little bit different, but he was saying it teaches you things that watching the cool guy stuff on YouTube doesn't show you. Where everybody's got open top magazines everywhere, open top holsters. Then you watch somebody flip upside down for the first time. <laughs> and then they've got no mags and no pistol on them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I've talked to one pro shooter. His, his belt is festooned with magazines. And he accepts the fact that he's losing two as he runs around. And that's why he carries so many. Um, I would say if you're going to use competition for training, there's only 
two types, in my opinion, that really will give you any uh, advantage or real training. First is CMP, because that is pure marksmanship training. And usually the old guys there at the match have learned or forgotten more about marksmanship than you can ever hope to learn. So it's good for learning and it's good for just really developing your fundamentals. And when you want to get in beyond that, the brutality style matches, they're designed around a uh, martial spirit and they are, um, you know, they dispense with a lot of the uh, USPSA IDPA gimmickry. Um, you know, they're, they're, all the scenarios tend to be practically based and with practical skills. Hey, uh, to jump on top of that, uh, some of the best independent training I've done outside of the Marine Corps has just been going out to the Bureau of Land Management land out there in Nevada. Doesn't cost a dime. And we're literally just setting steel out there. We're shooting at known distance first. So you know your dope's on. And you're building that confidence that, hey, I know at this distance, I can, I'm aiming here, I'm holding here, and I'm hitting, right? And then going out there and setting that steel with that 18 inch, you know, shoulder to shoulder cross distance and doing, you know, unknown distance stuff using your reticle to estimate range and then taking those unknown distance target, you know, engagements and building that confidence. That has been some of the best marksmanship training that I've done on the civilian side of the house. And literally it costs nothing. No, you pay nobody to go out there in that land. So if you live in those areas that have that BLM land, I mean, that was just, that's just amazing. So much so that I, I try to do it every year. So. All right. Well, I think we're going to start wrapping up then. Um, so I'm going to go around the horn. Uh, any closing statements? Also tell people where they can go get a hold of you. Um, any parting parting messages you want to go? So we'll start with Brent. Ah, put me on the spot. <laughs> so uh, all right, if you're not subscribed to me, you can check out my channel. It's uh, Brent0331, uh, all one word. And uh, I've got a bunch of just, just large variety of videos, mostly centered around military oriented topic topics. And, uh, lately I've gotten into live streaming mostly because of, uh, <laughs> the debacle in Afghanistan is what kind of kicked that off. But, uh, I've started to go down this path where I'm interviewing war fighters, uh, guys that have gone down range and, uh, guys I've served with. And, and eventually I'm going to get to guys that I haven't served with. Uh, but one guy that I interviewed recently, uh, as Sunday was major Fred Galvin and, uh, his boys kind of got dragged through the dirt, uh, falsely accused of war crimes. And it was just a absolutely fascinating interview that I had with him. Uh, and he's about to release a book called a few bad men. Uh, it's up for pre-order on Amazon. So I uh, highly encourage all of you to go over there and check out the interview. It was, it was very captivating uh, even as the interviewee uh, interviewer. Sorry. Uh, so um, that's pretty much it guys. Check me out. Brent zero three, three, one. If you have any questions, I, I try to reply to all legitimate comments that are posted. And then uh, that's pretty much it. All right. Thanks. We'll go to Doc. All right. Well, it's already been uh, mentioned. So by all means, um, come join us at One Shepherd. There is Bravo Company out here in West Virginia at the BSR. Um, this year we have two semesters um, and in the spring and the fall. And then Alpha Company out there at the CMTC in Central Missouri um, has two semesters, um, June and October. Yeah, the summer semester and their fall semester. So uh, by all means, go to OneShepherd.com and uh, look us up there. Uh, let us know if you have any questions. Um, you can reach out to us and we'll, you know, it's a very helpful um, community, warrior community. Um, and, uh, you know, it's all force on force, by the way, it is not live fire. There's no live fire. It's all force on force, but it's small unit tactics. Other than that, you can find me on YouTube. I am Christopher Larson, Doc Larson. Um, but it's Christopher Larson. And I, um, on YouTube, I live out my fantasy of being a professor of, um, leadership and small unit tactics. Well, check out my channel, Pegasus Test. I generally do gear reviews of all different types of gear that you would use in the field. I also do coverage of competition uh, shooting events and also the uh, One Shepherd semesters. And I try to use a lot of the gear that I test in these scenarios and at competitions. So it's not just say, hey, this thing exists. It's actually field tested so I can tell you how it works. 
All right, and then I'll round it out. So uh, thank you to all the guests, Brent, Les, and Doc. Thanks for coming out. Um, I know, again. Um, so I'll leave a parting parting message for the evening is I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, come to the website, everydaymarksman.co, and you're going to find notes for this stream session, uh, as well as all the other articles, podcast episodes, and streams. Uh, and we're on a kick lately talking about what I think is the minimum capable citizen. So what are these minimum skill sets that you as a prepared everyday person should should pursue the most recent one was handgun skills um so come check out the website and i will see you all there and on that note have a great night